All right. It is now noon here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I am. And so it's the occasion to say good afternoon. But I know for many of you, it is good morning, good evening, good middle of the night. Uh, we see where you're coming in from all over the world. So thank you for being here with us and welcome to this edition of PON Live from the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. I'm Nicole Bryant. I'm the Managing Director here at the Program on Negotiation. And we are so pleased to have you with us for this, our first live event of the new year 2024. And so I'd like to start by extending very warm and heartfelt New Year's wishes on behalf of all of the faculty, staff, and researchers here at the Program on Negotiation. And it is a very uh, special thing to unite our community members uh, from all across the world today for this first event uh, featuring a, a distinguished speaker who is, of course, very dear to us, uh, William Yuri, one of the co-founders of the Program on Negotiation, also a distinguished fellow at the Harvard Negotiation Project, a co-founder of the Abraham Path Initiative and uh, of the Climate Parliament. He is also the co-author of Getting to Yes, as well as many other works with which I am sure you are very familiar. But today we are here for his uh, latest uh, work, Possible, how we uh, survive and thrive in an age of conflict. And this book is set to be launched on February 20th. It is available for pre-order today. We put uh, the link at the top of the chat, but we will put it in again in just a few minutes uh, so that you can pre-order it. And uh, this one hour live event is meant to give our participants a taste of what is in this work, uh, what your appetite to read it completely. But if at the conclusion of it, you decide that you wanna go further, um, I am pleased to announce that you have a great opportunity to study more in depth with William and the program on negotiation in just a couple of weeks, because on February 6th, he will be leading a one day class on uh, this same topic. So if you'd like to go in deeper, we would love to have you join us uh, for the day uh, in a, a PON program. Before I hand over the virtual Zoom microphone to our uh, distinguished speaker, I would like to thank all the many folks who go uh, into making an event like this possible. So for the PON staff, our events coordinator, Diane Long, our program assistant, Lindsay Sullivan, our assistant director, James Kerwin, and then uh, Olivia uh, Grottenheis, uh, and I apologize, Olivia, if I mispronounce your name, uh, uh, it has also been uh, really um, key in getting this event up today. So thanks to all of them, and thank you to our wonderful participants tuning in uh, we are so delighted to have you with us. And now I will not delay our main speaker any longer. I will cede the floor. We are very happy to have him to William Urey. Thank you, Nicole. It's a great pleasure to see you all in the chat coming in from around the world. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to speak with you a little bit about my new book, Possible. Uh, let me tell you a little story of how the book came about. It was a few years ago, one sunny autumn day when the leaves were turning, and I was taking a hike in the mountains of Colorado with my friend Jim Collins, the well-known leadership author, when he suddenly turned to me and asked, Bill, do you think you could sum up the essence of all that you've learned in one sentence? I looked at him with a very surprised look on my face. And he continued, well, you, you know, you've been wandering around the world for the last 45 years and working in some of the world's toughest conflicts from the Cold War to the Middle East, from strikes to boardroom battles. What do you think can help us in these times of intense conflict? In a single sentence, he added with a smile. Well, Jim's challenge intrigued me. Uh, I gave it some careful thought. And on our next hike a few months later, I gave it my best try. Jim looked straight at me and said, now go write the book. Now I wrote this book with these times in mind, but I don't think I had any idea it would be quite so timely with so many difficult conflicts facing us today from war in the Middle East to war in Ukraine, to the threat of war in Korea, to US-China tensions over Taiwan, to the intense political polarization in many of our countries, including the United States. 
I was uh, originally trained as an anthropologist. And if I were a Martian anthropologist, looking at us now, I would say we're living in a time of great paradox. Never before in human evolution, thanks to our inventive technologies and our abilities to cooperate, have we enjoyed such an abundance of opportunities to solve the world's problems and live the life that we want for ourselves and our children. This is a moment of enormous potential. And yet, at the same time, with all the disruptions brought about by the same forces of technological, economic, and social change, we face a wave of destructive conflict that's polarizing every facet of our lives, from our families, to our democracies, from our work, to our world, and it's paralyzing our ability to work together. So let me just ask you, if I may, just a question, because you're around the world here, we can all learn. If you wouldn't mind just putting in chat, where do you see in your own life destructive conflict arising around you? Do you see it in the, you know, is it, do you see it in your families? Do you see it in the workplace? Do you see it in your communities, in your nations? And where around the world, in other words, what particular conflicts are on your radar screen as, uh, as we connect right now? Just, if you wouldn't just mind putting that in chat, just so we get a sense, polarization, social media, our communities, the Middle East, yeah, so homelessness, partisan politics, you know, I just see them flash by. So that's... That's the problem that we're facing right now. And the question I have is, that I try to address in this book is, how can we possibly navigate these waves of conflict so that we can realize the enormous opportunities that lie before us? And here's the twist. We can't end these conflicts, nor in many cases should we. It may sound strange for me to say this, but I actually believe we, we need more conflict, not less in this world. And by that, I mean the kind of healthy conflict that allows us to engage our differences, to grow, to address the many injustices, and to change what needs to be changed. Conflict is natural. It's part of human life. And our real choice is not to get rid of conflict, but it's rather to transform it. In conflict situations, we tend to fall into what I like to call the three A trap. The first A stands for attack. We go on the attack, an eye for an eye, and we all go blind. The second A stands for avoid. We pretend like the conflict doesn't exist, which doesn't solve anything, of course. And the third A stands for accommodate or appease. We give in. And often we do all three things. We avoid for a while, we even accommodate, and then we lose it. We go on the attack. Does that sound at all familiar? Each of us has a learning edge. And again, in chat, if you wouldn't mind just thinking about where your learning edge is. Um, is it to attack? Is that the edge, you know, your tendency? Or is it to avoid? I'd say that's probably mine. <laughs> Uh, the, the edge that I need to work? Is it to accommodate, to give in? What's your learning edge? Just think about that for a moment. And then if you put that in chat and I see a lot of avoids, accommodate, defend, and then attack, <laughs> a lot of them, great. Uh, so let's ask, what's the way out of this trap? What's the way out of the 3A trap? I would suggest that the way out is very different from attacking or accommodating, and it's perhaps the exact opposite of avoiding. It's to, paradoxically, it's to welcome conflict. It's to lean into it. You know, when I was writing this book, I happened to go away on a two-week rafting adventure down the great Grand Canyon here in the United States. And once you're in that canyon, you're in it for the duration, and you're facing the biggest river rapids, the biggest waves in North America. The water is very cold. And so you're faced with a choice. You can either resist each wave as it comes many times a day, and it's freezing temperature, or you can lean in and embrace it and even enjoy it. 
And it occurred to me on that trip that these turbulent waves, those turbulent waves on the river, are a little bit like the turbulent conflicts that we face. And I wondered to myself, what if we treated today's difficult conflicts like those giant rapids on the great rushing Colorado River? What if we actually embrace conflict and then proceeded to transform it? And by transform, I mean simply change the form of conflict from destructive fighting into creative, constructive, collaborative negotiation of the kind that I think you each know well. As I reflect on the toughest conflicts and wars I've been involved in, I would say that even after agreement, in many cases, the conflict continues. But the key thing is that the fighting, the destructive fighting, the war, the violence ends. The conflict is transformed into constructive dialogue, into problem-solving negotiation, into democracy, and other nonviolent forms of conflict. So the question is then, what do we need to do today to transform our conflict so that we can navigate these turbulent times? If I had to synthesize as my friend Jim asked me to do on that mountain hike, drawing on all I've learned from my own experience, many, many failures as well as successes, I would suggest that we need three things above all. We need a clear perspective, what I like to call the balcony. We need an attractive way out or attractive ways out, which I like to call the bridge. And we're gonna need lots of help from others in the community, which I call the third side. Now, in these times of intense conflict in which win-lose thinking is so prevalent, it might seem that the mutual gains approach offered by getting to yes asks too much, and that perhaps we need to be less audacious in our goals and our methods. But let me be bold and suggest the exact contrary. I propose that we need to be even more audacious in our negotiating approach. When Roger Fisher, Bruce Patton, and I collaborated on getting DS over 40 years ago, we tended to focus more on the bridge, you know, on how to reach a mutually satisfying agreement. And while that's important, even essential, it's often not enough to address today's challenging conflicts. The truth is we can't build a bridge without the perspective from the balcony. And it's hard, very hard to go to the balcony and build the bridge these days without help from others, which I call the third side. I've come to realize that we need all three together surrounding a conflict like in that diagram all the time. So let's start for a moment just with the perspective, the balcony. Here's the thing, when it comes to today's tough conflicts, we are often our own worst enemies. Maybe the biggest lesson I've learned since getting to yes is that the greatest obstacle to getting what I want is not what I think it is. It's not the difficult person on the other side of the table. It's the person on this side of the table, it's me. It's the person I look at in the mirror every morning. It's our own natural, very human, very understandable tendency to react, often out of fear and anger. We human beings, we are reaction machines. We lose perspective, and we often act in ways that go exactly contrary to our own interests. As the old saying goes, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. And that happens more often than, than we think. What's the alternative? It's to do the exact opposite of reacting. It's to pause for a moment. It's to get some perspective. It's to think about what you really want and how you can get there. Imagine yourself negotiating on a stage and then your mind goes to a kind of like a balcony overlooking the state, overlooking the stage. It's a place of calm. It's a place of perspective. It's a place of self-control where you can keep your eyes on the prize, what's truly important, and you can see the bigger picture. The balcony is a place from which you can meet animosity with curiosity. 
And I learned the balcony lesson perhaps most dramatically when in the middle of a political mediation in the country of Venezuela, many years ago, I was confronted by the president, Hugo Chavez, in front of his entire cabinet. Uh, it was midnight and he asked me how things were going. And I made the mistake of saying, I thought, you know, I'd been talking to some of his ministers and I thought there'd been some progress. He said, progress? What are you talking about? Are you a fool? You third parties are naive or you don't see the tricks, the, the dirty tricks the other side is up to? And he leaned in close to my face so I could feel his hot breath as he shouted at me. Well, I felt embarrassed, like all my work had gone down the tubes. I was about to react defensively when I caught myself and thought, is it really going to serve my purpose of calming the situation here in Venezuela if I get into an argument with the president? So I bit my tongue instead. And I listened to him instead with curiosity. After 30 minutes of him shouting, I finally, I watched, I was watching his body language and I saw his shoulders slowly sink. And he asked me in a weary tone of voice, so Yuri, what should I do? Well, that my friends is the faint sound of a human mind opening. So I said, Mr. President, it's almost Christmas. People are exhausted from the conflict. Why don't you call a truce, a tregua, over the holidays? Well, he paused for a moment. He looked at me, surprised. And then he announced, that's an excellent idea. I'm going to propose that in my next speech. He proceeded to clap me on the back. His mood had completely shifted. I learned then and there that the greatest power that we have in negotiation is the power not to react. It's to stop, it's to pause, it's to go to the balcony instead. On the balcony, you can ask yourself what you really want, what's truly important to you, and you can see the big picture of how you might get there. Now, we all have our favorite way to pause. It might, to go to the balcony, it might simply be to take a deep breath, you know, get a little oxygen so that uh, we can think more clearly. Or it might be to take a break if we can. Or it might be to go for a walk or go for a coffee with a friend. In chat, why don't you put, think about what's your favorite way to pause? What's your favorite way to go to the balcony? We all have our favorites. So uh, just think about it. Just again, just, yeah, nature, cup of tea, run, play music, three breaths, coffee. You know, those, that's exactly it. That's what we need more and more in today's world because it, we're living in this very reactive world. We need more and more to compensate by finding ways to go to the balcony and help others around us go to the balcony. So that brings us to the next challenge. In today's tough conflicts, we need more than ever to be able to find a way out, out of the labyrinth of conflict, out of destructive fights, because the other side may be far from cooperative. They may dig in and they refuse to budge. They pressure us, they attack, they threaten. So here's the challenge. Their position, their mind is very far away from yours. There's a huge chasm in between where you are and where they are. And that chasm may be filled with fear, with anxiety, with doubt, with unmet needs, with the fear of looking weak, with distrust. You want them to agree with you, but it's not at all easy for them to do so. Our challenge is to build a bridge over that chasm, to, make, to help them move in the direction we want them to move. It's not just an ordinary bridge. It's a golden bridge. It's an attractive way out. Think about it this way. In difficult conflicts, parties tend to push against each other. You know, if, if you just, for example, imagine here that I'm, I'm pushing here, you've got your hands up, you're pushing back. What do you instinctively do? You naturally, if people feel pushed, they push back. And that's what happens in conflicts. That's why we have so many stalemates. If you want to build a golden bridge, we have to break out of that trap. Instead of pushing, we need to do the exact opposite, which is to attract. Instead of making it harder for the other side, we need to do the exact opposite, which is to make it easier for them, easier for the other side 
to make the decision you want them to make. We need to leave our thinking for a moment and start the conversation, not where we are, but where they are. We need to listen to them. We need to try to put ourselves in their shoes, however difficult that might be, because they might be very difficult. And we need to help figure out what their needs are, their fears, so that we can address them while advancing our interests too. In other words, we need to create an attractive way out for them and for ourselves. You know, the filmmaker Steven Spielberg used to like to tell a story when he was 13. There was a bully in school who beat him up, who's 15, who beat him up for the entire year. Young Stephen used to run home from school, dive under his bed, call out safe to himself. And then one day he asked himself, how do I get this bully off my back? So he went up to the bully one day and he said, you know, even then he was making home movies. He said, I'm making a home movie about fighting the Nazis. And I was wondering if you'd like to play the war hero. Well, the bully laughed in his face. But a few days later, kind of grudgingly, he came back and said, okay. So young Spielberg dressed him up in camouflage, gave him a backpack, made him the war hero in his movie. And after that, Spielberg reports that bully became his best friend. His best friend in high school was his bully who had beaten him up for an entire year. So think about the reversal there. Think of how does a bully get turned into a best friend? What's the psychological process that he went through? You have to ask yourself, why does a bully bully? What's the motivation? Think about it. You might even put it in chat. You know, is it a sense of power? Is it a sense of status, recognition? You know, we often think, you know, bullies are strong, but actually they're motivated often by insecurity. Underneath that, there's insecurity. And that's really the basic human needs that young Steven Spielberg met in making the bully the war hero in his movie. That's how he turned it around. That's what it means to build the other side a golden bridge, to make it as easy as possible for them to move in the direction you want them to move. My favorite exercise for building a golden bridge is to begin by writing the other side's victory speech. It's a thought experiment. You start from the end and you work backwards because sometimes in difficult conflicts, you might not be able to see a way to get from here to there. But sometimes you might be able to imagine yourself there already and work your way back to here. And then you can find your way back there. So imagine for a moment, just as a thought experiment, that the other side has already said yes to your proposal. Unbelievable in some situations, but they said yes. They accepted what you want them to do. Now they have the job of ha having to explain to the people they care about, their constituency, why they accepted your proposal. They have to explain it as a victory for them too, not just for you. What would be the three key points of their victory speech? What would be those talking points? If you can visualize that victory speech, then you can think about what you can do to help them deliver that victory speech. Whether you're asking your boss for a raise or whether you're figuring out how to end a war, I find that that thought experiment of the victory speech can open up new creative possibilities, new ways out that we hadn't imagined before. That's the art of building a golden bridge. Now I've used that in different situations. I remember once vividly back in early 2017, trying to imagine ways to avert a nuclear war that was building between the risk of which was building between the United States and North Korea. North Korea's Kim Jong-un was busily testing nukes and missiles and President Trump told him to stop or else each one was hurling invective and threats at the other, fire and fury, little rocket man. You know, the risk of war was as high as 50-50 and at least that's what many people in the White House thought and many experts as well. Well, my colleagues and I began by trying to write Trump and Kim's victory speeches in which they didn't go to war. And it was, you know, think about it. It was like Trump needed to say something like, I got the best deal ever. I kept America safe and I didn't spend a penny. And Kim needed to say something like, my rule, my country are secure. We're finally getting the respect we deserve and we're gonna become the next Asian economic tiger. Well, 
going through that exercise, it didn't seem so impossible. And so it encouraged my colleagues and myself to embark on a major independent initiative to try to help interrupt the escalation to nuclear war. And I was amazed that, you know, a year later in Singapore, you know, both leaders of these enemy countries were able to meet and each announced victory. And, and it wasn't like they even had to actually reach, you know, a peace treaty, this changing the narrative, changing perceptions, the risk of nuclear war went down from maybe as high as 50% to less than 1%. So the big lesson for me is you start at the end, you begin with the victory speeches, and you work very hard to make it possible for them to, to deliver it. That's the golden bridge. Now, that leads me to the third thing that we need to deal with today's challenging conflicts, which is to acknowledge that it's sometimes not easy to go to the balcony. It's not easy to build that golden bridge. No matter how good we might be, we're often going to need help, lots of it. And here's the very common mistake we make when things get rough in conflict. We reduce the conflict to two sides. It's always, it's us against them. It's the you know, sales against manufacturing. It's union against management. It's Democrats against Republicans. It's Israelis against Palestinians. It's always like two sides. What we forget is that in any conflict, there is always a third side. The third side is the people around us, the friends, the family, the colleagues, the neighbors, the allies, the neutrals, the people around the community, the surrounding community. The third side constitutes a huge untapped potential resource that we can use to transform the conflict. It's like a container as you see in that diagram, within which even the hardest conflicts can begin to give way to dialogue, to listening, to negotiation. The surrounding community, the people around, can help calm down the parties who are fighting, can help them go to the balcony, get some perspective. It can bring the parties together and help them communicate and understand each other better. It can, in other words, help them explore a way out, a golden bridge. As an anthropologist, I've come to realize that the third side is our oldest human heritage for dealing with conflict. I've seen it in many different indigenous cultures, like the San Bushmen of the Kalahari. Whenever conflict arises, the whole community gets engaged. They circle around the campfire. I've come to realize that the third side is our birthright. It's available to all of us, and we need to find ways to recreate it in today's times. When conflicts are really hard, like many of those that we face today, we often need a kind of intervention from the community. I call it, I think of it as a kind of swarm, a critical mass, a critical mass of persuasive influence and assistance from those around that can help the parties find a way through their difficulties. Some years ago, I had the privilege to serve as a senior negotiation advisor to the president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, when he was trying to put an end to a 50-year civil war that had taken hundreds of thousands of lives and 8 million victims. Most observers at the time thought it was a lost cause, absolutely impossible. How did it become possible? Through a third side effort, through a swarm effort. I, I was one of five international advisors who made, we made over 25 trips to Colombia. It took a critical mass there. We served as a kind of what the president called a kind of balcony for him. We offered him perspective so he could try and figure out a way through this labyrinth. We were part of the third side and we also were advising him as he sought to mobilize the third side, the community. He built support within the country, within the business community, within the military, within the civil society trying to build support also outside the country, in Latin America, with the neighbors, with the United States in Europe, with the United Nations. He even won over political adversaries like Hugo Chavez of Venezuela or Fidel Castro of Cuba so that they would support the end of the war and help bring the guerrillas to the table. In short, he built what you might call a winning coalition, a winning coalition for peace. And that's what made the Golden Bridge possible. 
It took five years, but in the end, the guerrillas laid down their weapons. Santos won the Nobel Peace Prize, and the longest running war in the Americas came to an end. The conflict wasn't over, but it was transformed. That's the key. So here's a question for you to reflect on and maybe even put in the chat. Have you ever been part of or perhaps witnessed a collective intervention by the community, by the third side, by the people around the parties to transform that conflict? Maybe it's on a smaller scale in the family where a group of family members get together to help bring about some family harmony, or it might be in the community, or it might be in the workplace. I think if you think about it, and it's actually more common than we think. So this is the missing key that we need to deal with today's tough conflicts. We need to be able to mobilize that third side, the surrounding community, the people around. We may be third siders. In fact, I, I suspect many of you play that role. You are third siders. We are all third siders. Parents you know, are third side among their children, uh, you know, colleagues among their coworkers at work. The third side builds a winning coalition for agreement. There's an old Ethiopian proverb that goes, when spiders unite, they can tie up a lion. In other words, when people work together, we can pool our influence and power and accomplish great things. One spider might not be that powerful, but altogether they are. And in my lifetime, whether it's in Colombia and South Africa and Northern Ireland in other parts of the world, I've witnessed communities rise up to transform conflicts that were widely believed to be impossible. The third side is that great untapped power around us just waiting to be activated. So after all these decades working in tough conflicts and wars, people often ask me, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? And I like to answer that actually I am a possibilist, a possibilist. What's a possibilist? I believe in our human potential to transform even the toughest conflicts that we face from destructive fights into creative, constructive, collaborative negotiations. I believe, I believe it because I've seen it with my own eyes countless times, whether it's in bitter coal strikes in Appalachia, bitter boardroom battles, family feuds, and wars around the world. I've watched people unlock their hidden human potential and make what was widely thought to be impossible, possible. Where there are obstacles, possibilists look for opportunities. To be a possibilist means to change your mindset. Now, possibilists aren't blind to the dark side of human nature. To be a possibilist means to look at the negative possibilities too, but then to use that perspective to motivate us to look for the positive possibilities, the ones that avert the worst and optimize what's actually possible. I've seen how conflict can bring out the worst in us, but I've also seen how it can bring out the best in us. So what was that single summary sentence I offered my friend Jim Collins on that memorable mountain hike. The path to possible is to go to the balcony, build a golden bridge, and engage the third side. The balcony is that perspective, the bridge is the way out, and the third side is that help that we often need from others. I think of these as the three victories. Balcony is the first victory that we must gain, a victory with ourselves. Because if we can't influence ourselves, how can we possibly influence others? Bridge is the second victory. It's the victory with the other. It's that mutually satisfying outcome or relationship. And the third side is our third victory. It's engaging the community to help. It's the victory with the community, with the whole. So we influence ourselves, we influence the other, and we influence the whole, all three together. That's the key. It's not easy, far from it, but it's sometimes as simple as just one, two, and three, because these times call on us to unlock our full human potential, to activate all three sides of the conflict. 
It's the potential within us, that's the balcony. It's the potential between us, which is the bridge, and it's the potential around us, which is the third side. Put all those three together and we have something powerful. I urge you to make these three innate human potentials your close friends and allies on a daily basis. I like to think of them as our natural superpowers. They're yours to develop. Balcony, bridge, third side. BB3 for short. The point is this. We don't have to be victims of our conflicts. Conflicts, after all, are made by humans, so they can be solved by humans. In the end, as that Martian anthropologist would observe, the choice is ours. Now, when I was writing this book, I had the great pleasure of becoming a grandfather. And on the first day that my grandson, Diego, was born, I was able to hold him in my arms for an hour. I was in awe at the innocence in his face and all the potential of a little human being. And I was thinking about him and what he and his generation would, what would they ask us to do now if they were grown up and looking back at this moment? And what kind of world would they like to live in? What could we do to create that world? I'd like to call Diego my new boss, and I'm following his instructions. The choices that we make now will profoundly influence the world the next generation will inherit. So with them in mind, let me make a very humble request of you, since you're all negotiators interested in the field of negotiation, I ask you to consider becoming a possibilist. I have a hunch if you're on this call that you might already be one. My dream is that together we form a network, a worldwide league of possibilists who are ready and willing to help transform the world's toughest conflicts, starting with the conflicts closest to us at home, at work, in the community, and then out to the world. Why? Because I believe that there's almost no problem on earth that we cannot address. There's almost no opportunity we cannot realize if only we can learn to negotiate our differences and work together. I believe that if we can transform our conflicts, we can transform our lives and the lives of the people we love. I believe that if we can transform our conflicts, we can create the world we want for our children and ourselves. As was asked long ago, if not us, who? And if not now, when? Thank you. From my grandfather's heart. Wow, what an incredible call to action. And I think, William, you're seeing in the chat that uh, you have uh, an army of conflict resolvers and possibilists at your disposal to call upon. Um, this is also, of course, a very engaged group with lots of questions. So, you know, I will start by thanking you so much for your presentation. It is always a pleasure to learn alongside you. And uh, now I have the great opportunity to help uh, talk through some of the questions from our audience and to everyone who is still uh, on the chat. If you have a question that you haven't asked yet, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A function. I'm going to try to synthesize what we've got to get to as many as we can in, a, in the 20 minutes uh, that we have left. I will also take this opportunity to remind everyone that the recording of this event will be available in just a couple of days. So if you do need to drop off or you want to share this with somebody else um, or uh, relive that call to action, you will be able to do so. So with that, I'm going to start with a first bucket of questions, William, that I'm seeing from folks who may or may not be familiar uh, with your, your work and your teachings, but are really interested in the first aspect going to the balcony. So could you uh, remind us, uh, you know, instruct us in some steps to take for that first important action in, uh, in the process you've described? Yes. Uh, the balcony to me is, uh, is this metaphor of that we all have. It's an innate human potential. And we all have it if you just look around to just start by stopping. It's to, it's to, because we're so reactive in today's world, so reactive on social media, that, but there's this faint gap between the stimulus and the response. That's where the balcony is. It's in that ability to breathe for a moment. I go back to the chat here. 
kinds of things that you said that you use to go to the balcony, just to breathe, take some oxygen. You know, uh, it might be that moment moment of silence. You know, I have a colleague uh, at MIT, Jared Curran, who with his who with his uh, colleagues studied, you know, what makes for collaborative negotiation. They found there was a correlation between the amount of silence there was in the conversation and the amount of creative collaborative outcomes that came out. Silence is that great tool. So it's just that little moments of silence. Now, oftentimes balcony is also a time, you know, take a break just to break, you know, just take a break. You don't have to negotiate all the time. Take a break, get a coffee, go for a walk. I love to, for me, the my favorite way to go to the balcony is to go for a walk in nature because nature just calms my nervous system. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, psychologists tell us that there's this oftentimes, particularly in today's times, we get hyperactivated. Our nervous systems get very uh, activated and we get into fear and anger. And then after a while, we can't take it. We get to hypoactivation. We just drop into depression or resignation and we give up on the world. Well, in between the two, there's a band what psychologists call the window of tolerance. It's that, that optimal zone where you can be, you can have your emotions, but you're, you're at your most effective. That's what the balcony is. The balcony is preparing ourselves to be at our most effective because conflict actually turns out to be an inside job. We have to do that inside work in order to prepare ourselves to do the best outside work that we can. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and it, a lot of questions now going on to the a, a clear uh, wish from our uh, participants to extend a bridge. But how do you do it with someone who is? And you mentioned some cases of this from your own uh, from your own work and experience. Absolutely obstinate, tyrannical, not listening you know, complicated, uh, and, and, and what are those keys to success for beginning with the victory speech, moving towards that phase of extending a bridge? Well, first of all, I just want to say, <laughs> I, I completely, I get, you know, I get this, I completely sympathize with the idea that, you know, this is hard. This, I would say, this is some of the hardest work that we humans can do. It may seem simple, but it's actually really hard to do. Uh, and that's, that's the work that's in front of us. It's hard to do, but it's possible. I've seen it with my own eyes. And with the bridge in particular, the thing that I found, the human faculty that we all have, that I think is perhaps the most useful one for us to develop further, is the simple act of learning to listen. Now we can all listen, but there's a reason why we're given two ears and one mouth, which is to listen at least twice as much as we talk. On social media, there's a lot of talking. Everyone gets into talking, but who's actually listening? You know, uh, it's funny to me that in school, we teach a lot of things, but listening is not something that's often taught. And it's the kind of listening I'm talking about is something that's a natural human potential. It's the ability to listen not the way we usually listen, which is in our own shoes. You know, we, you know we, we hear what someone says, and then we're saying, I disagree with that, or I agree with that, or we're judging it. No, I'm talking about a listening where we put ourselves in the other side's shoes. We try to feel into them. We try to understand what makes them tick. That's what I was trying to do with President Chavez in that situation. That's what I, I've spent my life working in, in seemingly impossible situations. And sometimes it's the simple things like listening that can make all the difference because listening may be the cheapest concession you can make. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, the, it's a sign of respect. It's just how me, it, it's, a way, it's a way to actually help the other side go to the balcony. Because when people feel heard, when they feel met, their own nervous systems can start to relax and maybe there's a chance for them to be, to be, to be able to listen to you. That's so wonderful. And we have, you know, a myriad of questions about conflicts, either past, present, ongoing, all over the world. And I'm not going to ask you, William, to weigh in on every single conflict. 
um, even though I'm sure you would have a fascinating perspective. But I'll take you know just a couple of examples because I do think it's interesting for us to delve into case studies. And I'll note that um, you know uh, our colleague uh, and friend Max Bazerman of Harvard Business School is asking about this particular moment in U.S. electoral politics. Uh, we have a primary in New Hampshire uh, going on today. How can we help as citizens, for those of us who are in the U.S. Or, or, or folks who are merely interested in engaging with opposing political parties in a, in a time that is rife with conflict and strife? Well, first, a uh, uh, hearty uh, uh, hello to, to Max, my colleague. Uh, you know, I would say one of the ironies for me is I've spent probably the bulk of the last 45 years working on conflicts in other parts of the world that were seemingly impossible, places like South Africa or Northern Ireland or Colombia or Korea or Chechnya or the Cold War. And it's kind of... Uh, ironic and, and, and heartbreaking to me to come back to my own country and find that we have an intractable conflict right here. It's intractable, uh, it's very hard, we shouldn't underestimate how hard it is, but it's not impossible. Because I think if we, if we do this, we go to the balcony for a moment, and it's hard because right now everyone's kind of, you know, everyone's going to the gutter, they're not going to the balcony, you know, they're, and, uh, but if we go to the balcony, I think we could see that we have an enormous um, opportunity, which is to prevent something far worse that could happen in our country. I mean, I've seen polls that suggest that at different times, the majority of Americans are afraid that this kind of conflict, partisan struggle that we see in our country could lead to massive violence, even a, a civil war. And when you, you hear that kind of talk, which means that we have an enormous opportunity to prevent that before it happens. Um, because once I've been in a lot of civil war situations around the world, once the blood starts to flow, it's really hard to stop. And it's almost impossible for Americans to get their head. It, it seems unthinkable. But the thing is, we look at that neg from the balcony and possibly look at negative possibility. So you look at the negative possibility, things would get a lot worse. And then you look for the positive possibility. And the thing I'd say, again, going back to the, the third side in the American situation is, What's interesting is on, in, in the news, on social media, you hear kind of such you know, virulent combat going on. But the truth is, when pollsters talk to Americans, there is a majority of Americans, sometimes called the exhausted majority, but it's more than 70% of Americans in polls, for example, Americans will say, we have more in common than what divides us. That's like 73% of Americans will say that. You know, a, a similar number will say, will Americans still believe it is possible to disagree in a healthy way? And a similar number of Americans believe it's our responsibility as Americans to reach out and engage with those who have different views. So that to me is like the latent um, resource that we need to tap, we need to activate that. We don't see it because those people, you know, we don't hear those voices so much in either social media or on, on cable news. But that's the opportunity is, uh, is as Americans, we need to think ahead and think of the worst, think of the negative possibilities, and then come around and look for where the positive possibilities are and look for where that third side, that great common core of America that can serve as a container for this very polarizing election that could lead to consequences that none of us would wish. William, you, you mentioned social media and we have a number of questions about social media specifically and how it relates to the third side. Um, so the idea of calling in and it could be on social media or in, in, other, in other ways, um, you know, uh, experts and a community to weigh in or help manage that conflict um, how do you balance the decision to do that with a need for privacy in an era where sometimes things are, are, are made very transparent and public, and that may not always be conducive to actually solving something? I think, you know, we have the most amazing technological genius as human beings, and we're just in this first era of learning to communicate in a different way through social media. You know, as, as an anthropologist, I step back and look at that. I mean, right, right now, you know, 
if I were to look back, you'd be that Martian anthropologist for a moment. You know, we're living in the era that maybe a future anthropologist would see us. We're living in the era of the human family reunion, where suddenly, you know, 8 billion people, you know, 15,000 different language groups, we're all in touch with each other. And like many family reunions, it's not all peace and light. It's, there's a lot of dissension and inequity and anger and, and fear and so on. And the question is, how are we going to deal with our differences and how are we going to communicate? Now, we're in that first wave of social media where the algorithms of social media that are developed actually amplify conflict because they want, <laughs> they, they want engagement and engagement brings you know, profit. And so we need to think, can we, can we tweak those algorithms? Can we you know, be creative here and create the kind of social media, the kind of way that we can communicate in a way that actually surface, you know, allows for listening, allows for, allows, you know, we're just, we have to experiment with it. And now with AI, even more so, uh, that we actually have, this is what I'm saying, we live in this time of great paradox where we have this amazing, these amazing technologies, but we need to learn to experiment with them to figure out how to use them to transform conflict and not just amplify it. Lovely, thank you. Um, we have a question from Ashley that's also echoed uh, by others, which is, you know, how uh, many folks on this chat are uh, mediators or educators or researchers, and they convey skills of negotiation and conflict resolution to others. What are some of your top tips as someone who's been doing this uh, for uh, for many years in 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 teaching skills to a younger generation of how to successfully uh, resolve conflict? You know, um, that's a really good question. There's a lot of people in the younger generation who are looking at the world right now and they're saying, wow, what kind of world are we inheriting? And they're feeling anxious, they're feeling uh, angry, but there's also, a, a, at the same time, I think this is why the, the message of possibilism is such, such an important message right now. It's uh, because it's, sometimes it's hard to look at the world and be hugely optimistic. Uh, but if, you're, if you say, I'm a possibilist, in other words, you, you see possibilities. You can see that you acknowledge the negative possibilities. And then you use that knowledge of negative possibilities then to open up and say, okay, now where are the positive possibilities? What can we do? And I'd say the best way I've found, you know, again, talking with young people, and perhaps you, you, you on the call may have better ideas than this, is it's really to hear them address them, hear their fears, hear their concerns, listen to them, engage with them, feel what they're feeling, and then say, okay, now that's true. You know, there's, there's truth in that. Can we step back and look at where are the positive possibilities? And, and, and I would say the key that I've realized is, is that this, these are all innate human potentials. This is not like, uh, something from outside. Uh, these are, I would help people understand that in their own experience, where do you go to the balcony? As a, you know, and then everyone goes, oh yeah, I do this and I do that to go to the balcony. When have you built bridges successfully or when have you seen it? And people will come up with experiences from their own. When have you seen the third side activated, the, the kind of people around? When have you been a third sider? And if you ask those kinds of questions, young people start to realize, yeah, I go to the balcony, I've built bridges, I'm a third sider. And then it's, it's not a question of reinventing, it's not a question of inventing something new, it's a question of discovering something that's already inside of them. We all have that innate human potential. It's a question of just awakening it. Thank you, that, that makes for a good segue to a question that I, I think is really interesting about how your background and training as an anthropologist has helped you uh, to get to uh, to to get to this research, and how those of us who are not anthropologists can harness some of these tools in our in our own lives and and individual situations. Well, I would say we're actually all anthropologists. I mean, an anthropologist simply is a student of human nature, human culture, and you know, we're as human beings, we're always observing things around us. So. In, in that sense, we're, we're all anthropologists, we're all students of, of people. 
you know, we spend our, you know, you know, I, I notice with my with my young grandchild or my children, you know, you know, we grow up studying human beings and we we watch people around us. So in that sense, we're all anthropologists. I would say what what anthropology helped me with was it, it anthropology is about seeing if you can put yourself in the shoes of others uh, and understand that there are very different ways of seeing things from one culture to another culture. It's, it's that art of, uh, and that may be, you know, the, the single most important competence to be an effective negotiator. If we're trying to influence the other side, we have to know where the other side's mind, where their heart is, what, what motivates them, what are their basic needs and interests, what are their drivers. And so I would say in that sense, anthropology was a natural segue for me into, into negotiation and mediation. And again, I would say that's something, empathy, the ability to put ourselves in the other side's shoes is actually a natural human capacity that we all have. We just need to develop it and hone it and empower it in others. Lovely. Um, we have a question from um, Pramod who, who is asking, and I'm sure it's very difficult to rank them having worked on many uh, intractable conflicts over the course of your career. Is there one that stands out to you as the hardest, the most complicated, or of which you're particularly proud for the role that that you played, William? Well, uh, that's a that's a hard question. First of all, I would say, you know, in my in my in my work as a negotiator, you know, there's often failures. Uh, you know, my very first. Uh, I, when I was just in graduate school, still my very first attempt at mediation was was in a coal mine in Kentucky, where where uh, you know I, I wanted I, wa I wanted experience, and I went down there with my colleague Stephen Goldberg, and we went down there, and the 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 the, the miners, the union, and the management wouldn't even sit in the same room together, and they had guns, and there were bomb threats, and there were wildcat strikes, and uh, and you know we we finally brought the managers and the union leaders together and there was a great you know agreement and then we thought it's great but then guess what <laughs> uh there was a vote the next week uh by the by the miners and they voted against the agreement that their leaders had just negotiated because why because they didn't trust management uh, they didn't trust anything even if the agreement was better for them so that was a you know so all i'm saying is that there that was a very tough one i remember at that moment uh, too, uh, there was, you know, I had to go down at that moment. I had to try and think what what could what could we do. So I ended up moving down to Kentucky and spent two months spending a lot of time inside the coal mine because the only way to build trust was to get there in among the miners a mile underneath and going through various adventures that I tell about my book, like uh, being tackled by by four coal miners forced to the ground, pulling out a knife. So a lot lot of adventures like that. So I'm not saying it's it's, I had to learn the hard way through these initiations, but it's all about, in the end, about building trust. Coming back to the question of what's, what I'm proudest of, I don't know, actually. Uh, I think what, 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 what fills me the most is when I see the third side rise up, uh, the community rise up. So it's not just me, or it's not just the magical mediator. I really think that today's times is going to require a kind of collaborative group genius, collective genius, where it's not just the, the one person who shows up to help. And I've seen that happen in, in uh, Colombia, as I said. I saw it happen in South Africa, where the people of South Africa came together. I saw it happen in Northern Ireland, where the people of Northern Ireland came together. And that's really what inspires me the most, is that kind of is the, is the emergence of, of the third side, which as I mentioned, is our, is our human heritage, it's our birthright. Incredible, we're just about at time, but I'm gonna ask one more question because we have you know, over 800 people at, at some point on this webinar, I'm very excited to be here. So for those in, uh, in our audience who are mediators, who are actively working to help solve conflicts, parting advice uh, for them uh, and, and words of wisdom uh, as they go forward to carry out this mission and be part of the community of problem solvers? The parting words would be, this is hard work. <laughs> There's no question that it can be the hardest work that human beings can do. 
And it is possible. I've seen in my lifetime so many situations. When I started off at Harvard many years ago, you know, the impossible conflicts. There was going to be race war forever in South Africa. There was going to be sectarian war forever in Northern Ireland. There was going to be a cold war between the United States and the Soviet Union forever. And what I saw is each one of those conflicts yielded to patient, persistent negotiation and mediation. So it is possible. And I have, I'm counting on you, mediators out there, to, to really uh, transform these conflicts. Because if we can transform these conflicts, we can truly transform the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, William. And thank you to everyone for being here today. I know we have a devoted uh, group of students, really lifelong students, who are here learning alongside us. So I appreciate uh, your time, William, of course, as well as the time of everyone else here. A quick word about what is coming up ahead. So uh, our next events are in February. We have an inaugural Roger Fisher speaker series talking about the legacy of another PON uh, co-founder, Roger Fisher. Uh, and uh, that will be our Valentine's Day celebration on February uh, 14th, as well as other events that are in the works and getting planned as we speak for February. So please stay tuned uh, so that you uh, can participate. And then, of course, once the snow ends here in Cambridge, uh, we start to welcome folks back onto campus for in-person training. So you will see all of our programs that we're hosting uh, here in Cambridge, as well as virtual programs, the next of which, as I mentioned at the outset of this event, is being taught by William, an entire day on the topics uh, that we have touched on so briefly here. So we would, of course, be honored to have you with us on February 6th. Uh, if you are so inclined. Uh, regardless, uh, we wish everyone a very uh, pleasant conclusion of their day, evening, or night. Thank you once again for being here. Stay safe and be well. Bye. <laughs>